Thank you, Jan, and thank you to all who are coming tonight. Tonight we'll cover a few topics. Uh, first, what is a succulent? How to select and grow succulents? Succulent care, including water, soil, and environment. How to propagate succulents? Common problems? And where you can go to enjoy succulents in nature? So what is a succulent? The word succulent is derived from Latin succulentus, meaning juicy or fleshy. Succulent plants, including the cactus family, have a highly specialized anatomy to enable them to survive prolonged drought. They're able to store moisture and fleshy tissue in their stems, roots, and or leaves. They can be found in the deserts of North and South America, as well as Africa and Mexico. They're even found in the high mountains of the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So how do they do this? Well, they can store water. The swollen stems, uh, which can be round, columnar, or barrel-shaped, large, retain large volumes of watery mucus. This photo of the epiphyllum, or orchid cactus, which is a lovely plant. It only blooms once a year and only for a few days, but very worthwhile and beautiful. It's also an easy plant to propagate. Root succulents, such as the Senecio coccinea floris shown here, survive prolonged dry conditions by storing water underground in their tuberous or swollen roots. The stems and leaves can be thick and fleshy, providing the plant with additional water storing capacity. Leaf succulents, such as the Crassula falcata or the Echeveria, uh, Agavoides lipstick, shown here, store water in their thick, fleshy leaves, which shrivel in drought and then swell up again when water is available. The felcata, although it doesn't look like much here, produces a stunning red bloom in the summertime, and this can be left on the plant or cut for enjoyment in a vase or arrangement. It's also known as firecracker plant, as the bloom resembles fireworks and usually blooming around July 4th. This Echeveria also produces pretty red flowers in the summer, which again can be stored um, or just left on the plant. So succulent is actually not a botanical classification, but they are found in more than 70 to 80 plant families. Cactus have their own botanic family. And note that while all cacti are succulents, not all succulents are cacti. There are about 10,000 different types of succulents around the world. I don't think we'll cover all of them tonight, but we will show you the, a few here. Uh, the aloe aborescens or golden aloe, Echeveria party dress, and agave blue glow, just a few examples. So what is a plant family? Well, it's a plants that have similar flowers, reproductive structures, fruits or seeds, and are evolutionary related are grouped into plant families. Some examples of these include legumes, bees, beans and peas, nightshades, tomatoes, eggplant, potato and peppers, cabbage or cruciferous, such as cabbage, broccoli, arugula. This can help us figure out how they grow, what their seeds look like, what their flowers will look like. So how does this apply to succulents? Well, just to demonstrate, both the Senecio mandrelisque or blue chalk sticks and the sunflower, Helianthus, are in the Osterbrisiae or daisy family. This is a large widespread family of flowering plants. Many, but not all, will have closely packed flowers arranged in a head shape that look like a single bloom. There are more than 32,000 species spread over 1,900 genera and 12 subfamilies. The Senecio likes full sun, but will take part shade. It's also a fire resistant plant and demonstrates a spreading growth pattern. Produces an unremarkable small white flower that's attractive to bees and is one of the high heat tolerant succulents. Other members of this family include lettuce, chrysanthemum, dandelion, artichoke, sage, and many others. So all of these are euphorbias. 
The Euphorbiaceae or Spurge family has about 7,500 species and 275 genera of flowering plants. Some Euphorbia, such as the Trigona shown here, resemble a cacti, but it's not. Other plant members include cassava, castor bean plant, proton, rubber tree, crown of thorns, and, and the poinsettia. Many of these have a milky white sap that runs when the plant is cut or injured. The sap is quite irritating to the skin and toxic to pets. If you accidentally get the sap on your skin, please be sure and wash immediately. They also have unusual flowers that are attractive to pollinators. Some of these euphorbias will self-sow or spread very easily in your garden, and you may end up with a lot more of them than you want. So why should we grow succulents? Well, there's a lot of reasons to grow succulents. To start with, they're beautiful. This is my neighbor's garden in the spring. Note the blue Senecio um, that provides a lovely contrast to the other green and blue plants in his garden and the orange coral flowers of the aloes and the lampranthus, the gave blue flame and the Victoria Regine, it just among some of the other plants. In the summertime, this very same garden features many Echeveria and Crassula with red flowers. It's on a sloping Western exposure that provides plenty of sunlight and good water drainage. Succulents come in many forms and colors. This is a few examples here of a beautiful ruffled Echeveria, an aloe, again, the agave, Victoria Regine, very compact agave, and the agave of Batifolia or Frosty Blue, much bigger out uh, on the agaves. Other succulent benefits, ease of care. These plants are very low maintenance once you have them established. But note, low maintenance does not mean no maintenance. They do require some. Low water use, first noted during the drought of the 1970s, uh, but certainly <laughs> high value plant for today. And then firescaping functions. After devastating wildfires destroyed gardens in arid parts of the West, homeowners began to appreciate the way succulents survived and other plants perished. Some examples of the firescaping succulents, aloes, which we saw on the previous slide, Delosperma, Lampranthus hot flash, which is a nice a little compact um, spreading succulent, some ground cover sedums, such as the sedum morganianum or burrow's tail, and our friend, the Senecio. Succulents are fun. This is a picture of a pumpkin that's been topped with moss. The succulents are all glued on the top, creating a living centerpiece, which can later be transplanted into a container or your garden. These actually will keep going for a couple of months. And an example of an agave perii truncata that's been decorated for the holidays. So how to grow succulents? We like to start with the four foundations of success in any planting indoors and out. We refer, refer to these as good cultural care. Soil is the basis for a healthy garden. In the case of succulents, it needs to approximate the original texture and water holding capacity needed by these plants. Water. Consistent moisture in the soil is key. We all know that too much or too little water can create problems for plants. Aeration. Many people underappreciate the importance of air in our soil, and yet plants will not survive without the pore spaces in the soil, which allow the plants to obtain oxygen and the living things that live in the soil to breathe. Sun. Energy from the sun is a driver for plant growth. Just as for water, too much or too little sunshine can create problems. The interaction between soil and air temperatures, which are also determined by sunlight, are important for succulent plant health. Soil and aeration. We will be emphasizing drainage throughout the talk as this is one of the most important aspects in growing and caring for succulents. To accomplish this, you can add compost and red lava rock or pumice to your soil. 
Some things to consider in your soil. When planting in the ground, you wanna make sure that you have good drainage. Amend your soil as needed. Choose plants that naturally grow in similar conditions to those that you have in your garden. Select plants that need similar amounts of water to prevent over or under watering. When combining different varieties and containers, such as the one shown here, choose plants with a similar scale as you vary textures and colors. Plant both summer and winter growing succulents to have visual interest in the garden all year round. Summer growers are best planted in the spring, winter growers best planted in the fall. When you plant with this in mind, it helps ensure success. So in choosing your site to plant your succulents, the first decision is whether you wanna plant in the ground with space and sun permitting or in containers. In planting in the ground, you wanna turn the soil six to 12 inches and add your amendments. When planting in the ground, raised beds can provide the good drainage as plants need. Consider mounding the soil for better drainage. Most succulents will need about six hours of bright indirect light. Carefully note the eventual size the plants will grow to to ensure they're the proper scale and aesthetic effect that you're looking for. You can intersperse succulents among plants with low water needs, even if you have little space available. For mulch, you can use gravel, decomposed granite, decorative rocks, or glass. You can actually use ground bark chips, but the soil beneath this tends to hold more moisture, which is not recommended for succulents. Containers. If you want to plant in containers, you can use any type as long as it has a drainage hole. You want to co coordinate the size of the plant to the size of the container. Always start with a clean container. Some examples, terracotta containers, which dry out quickly, and they can be very heavy if they're large to start with. Small ceramic pots are easy to move around for changing light um, and weather conditions. Or large rectangular containers, very heavy and are pretty much stationary. You can note here the differences um, in planting pattern choices. If you leave space between the plants so there's room to grow, or you can plant them close together for a more immediate effect. The red pot contains multiple cut, same size multiple cuttings that took about five weeks to root. And then I could see immediately you could have a nice little arrangement. The terracotta container with the space succulents actually will take seven to eight months for that to fill in. So for your containers, you need a potting mix with good drainage. Again, you can use red lava rock or pumice or you know, to go in with your potting mix. Potting mixes for succulents typically have some pumice or lava rock in them, but you can always add. Uh, the soil source will determine the quality that you get. Perlite is often added for soil aeration, but this can retain water and actually can cause problems in the future. Containers need water about every one to two weeks, and you want to water until it actually drains out the bottom, but make sure the pots aren't going to sit in water. Turn the pot saucers upside down to avoid retaining water by the roots, and then you will need to refresh the plants and the soil about every two to four years. You can have succulents in your house. Um, Again, the same soil mix as container, got to have good, good drainage, allow to dry out in between waterings. Uh, plant these in the brightest area of your house and ensure that there is good air circulation. So water, one of the hardest parts with succulents. You want to make sure that the plants dry out between watering. There's just no hard and fast rule of when to water them. Check the soil for dryness. You can just very gently dig down about two to six inches with either a trowel or your fingers, or you can try a moisture meter, which can be helpful. If you look at the moisture meter, if it shows the moist end of dry, 
there's adequate water present. You don't need to water them. Less is always better than too much water. In houseplants, keep the top inch of your soil totally dry. Other watering considerations, ambient temperature and light. If your summers are hot and your winters have frost, this will affect how much and when you water. Plants grown in the coastal parts of the Bay Area generally need less water in the summer. Soil water holding capacity can also affect how often to water. Location in your garden and hours of sun will make a difference. If the plants are in containers, they dry out more quickly than in the ground and will need watering more often. Growth period of the succulents or their dormancy periods when they are not growing much also will make a big difference. And this will bring us to the fact that succulents actually have a season. There are um, summer dormant succulents that bloom in the winter, which is really wonderful, and then winter dormant succulents, which then bloom in the summer. When selecting plants, you want both winter and summer growers to have plants you can enjoy all year round. Winter or cool season growers are also called summer dormant. They prefer less water in the summer. These plants begin growing or producing new leaves in the fall. They'll slow down in midwinter and then resume growing through spring. The growth slows in the summer to conserve water during the dry months. Examples of these are Aeoniums, Sedums, Dudleya, Delosperma, and other ice plants, and Sempervivums. Summer or warm season growers are also called winter dormant. They prefer less water in the winter months. These plants will begin growing in the spring and continuing growing through summer and into the fall. They'll produce new leaves and offsets. Examples of these are Crassula, Echeverias, Calanchoes, and Senecios. Some sign indicating a succulent starts sleeping is that it stops producing new growth completely. The leaves might turn yellow brown and either drop or hang limply off the sides of the succulent stems. Agaves are an exception. They do most of their growing in the summer, but they will continue to grow in winter as long as they receive water. We will include a link to this graphic in the handout you will get once you complete the webinar evaluation. So we have an example here of the plant Aeonium conoriense. Um, this right here is the plant in its dormancy in the summertime. You might think the plant is dead. The plant really just does not look good at all. Uh, they'll, the rosettes will uh, contract, turn different colors, and just and generally look bad. But they will bounce back when they come out of dormancy. And that's really fun to watch. This is the plant that has come out and is now blooming really nicely. It's important to research and determine what time of year your succulents, succulents tend to grow dormant so you don't give it too much water and accidentally kill it or yank it out because you think it's dead. When a summer growing succulent starts its dormant period in the winter, it enters a survival mode and it stops growing actively, therefore doesn't need a lot of water. Give it a little water if you notice the leaves get dry and wrinkled, but in most cases, you don't even need to water at all. Just leave it alone until the growing season starts. Brings us to sun. Um, with sun, you'll see the same considerations as for watering. Tolerance to sun will vary by plant requirements, amount of direct or indirect light, or amount of shade in your garden. Ambient temperature. If the, con if the plants are in a container versus ground, the soil in the containers uh, get a little bit hotter and drier more quickly. So where should you plant your succulents? and how. Um, typically, if you're gonna buy succulents or cacti, the soil in the pots in the nursery is just regular potting soil, which will allow the plants to grow fast, but not necessarily the right uh, soil for them to thrive. So as soon as possible, you want to take it out of the container and be gentle, just re remove very gently from the container. Get most of the perlite and soil off the roots. 
Sometimes you may even need to wash the roots if it's indicated and then put it in the proper soil, fill in and firm the soil, leaving room for the plant to grow. This method is actually very helpful in getting rid of any pests or weeds that might come from the uh, plant store. Once you plant them, wait to water about three to four days after transplanting to allow for the roots to uh, settle. You don't need a really large space for succulents. You can have a little tiny succulent garden. An example is this garden in my neighborhood. It's a very small space with small succulents. There is a very large jade plant on the outskirts. This was actually almost six feet in height. But it can, you can see it contains one of the smaller agaves. This is the Lepantha, which is variegated green and white. And it's a slow grower, only reaching about 12 to 18 inches in height. The overall effect here is balanced because the jade plant is off to the side and has room to spread above the walkway. If it was in the center, it would be out of scale relative to the other plants. And this is a jade uh, or the Crashula avata in season, which has got its pretty colors and blooms. While jade plants can actually be grown in the shade, they would lack the vibrant colors of those grown in the sun and be a much duller green without the red coloration on the edges of the leaves. And they probably won't bloom. Or an alternative. If you don't want the old fashioned jade plant that's been around for years and years and years, consider the Crassula ovata golem, much more interesting plant. This can also be grown in shade. It won't be as colorful as this one in the picture, but it still has the more interesting shape. And you can see in the background here uh, next to the blue, uh, blue chalk senecio. So if you want agaves, uh, check the size before you plant one. You can see here, this nice small four to six inch agave Americana, which doesn't look too challenging, but they start small, they grow up. And if you have a small space, like the one in the previous slide, this plant, which can reach up to six to eight feet in diameter and height would definitely not work. They'll grow slowly, but they will grow. This is an example of a large agave planted in the wrong place. When they're planted next to walkways or driveways, they're often trimmed for safety reasons. These plants have very, very sharp points. So in a walkway like this, if it's planted so it's growing fully, it's just gonna grab everybody that walks by. So what people have done is trim it for safety purposes. However, the net result here is a plant that's lost its natural grace and shape. Check the plant tag before you take it home and do a little research beforehand and you'll save yourself and the plant pain and suffering. You really don't wanna to have to pull this plant out. It's not the easiest thing to do. While we're on the subject of plant tags, read them. They will tell you mature size, light conditions needed, cold hardiness, blooming pattern, and more. Now, if you still want agave, one thing you can do is there's much smaller scale of agaves. This Queen Victoria or Victoria Regine compacta is a small, compact, very elegant plant. You can actually even put this in a pot um, if you want to bring it inside. Uh, and there are other smaller scale agaves, um, the Blue Glow, Nacrocantha, Pink Ferdinand agave, Lepantha, like we saw in the previous garden, Shitagira, and Gemina flora. So, plenty of them out there to pick from that don't grow to the huge size. So, blooming pattern and life cycle for succulents. Uh, they're either monocarpic or polycarpic succulents. On the monocarpic ones, some of them will take a long time to bloom, but they will produce flower or fruit only once in their lifetime. Typically, they'll flower from the center. Many agaves are in this category, semper vivum, like the one shown here, some calanchoes and some senecios. With the semper vivums, they tend to 
one of them, like the maiden one here, will ble will bloom. And it'll actually, the bloom will last for a few months, but this portion will die. But these little offsets are left. Some of the agaves will also leave offsets, some do not. So once the plant blooms, um, the whole plant will die. However, it takes a long time to get to that point. The polycarpic succulents do not die after flowering. Many of the echeverias, euphorbias, aloes, warthia, they'll set seeds or offsets. Um, probably will bloom every year for you. They can, sometimes the blooms will last for several months. Very beautiful plants. So an example to a living and learning on succulents. You wanna use caution when you start your succulent garden. Succulents have become very, very popular. So it's easy to walk into any nursery now and wanna buy all of it. Uh, they're just really beautiful and you take them all home. So I had a new space to plant. I was sent an interesting design by a friend that looked like fun. So I went out, I got some rocks, gravel, and a whole bunch of plants. I mended the soil with compost and red lava rock and planted this little garden. Very easy to do, and it looked great for a while. What I didn't know at the time, there was underground water present. I hadn't raised the area up high enough to ensure the proper drainage. Not enough research before I was planted. Um, looked great for a while. However, most of the original plants did not survive, although the Dudley up here in the middle is actually still going strong, but the rest of them uh, went by the wayside. There are succulents that will tolerate a lot of heat. Um, many of them come from hotter parts of the world and they can tolerate more sun and higher temperatures. Some examples of these, um, the agave blue glow, the onium's wort cough, um, tachyphytum fit cowie, our friend the sunicio, and the golden barrel cactus. Um, note on this one, the tilt on the way the cactus grows. It tilts a little to the side to keep water off the top to prevent decay. The spines will help deflect wind and they also help protect the plant from predators. And there are cold hardy succulents, such as the agave blue flame. This can handle, uh, it can handle full sun, but it also can handle temperatures down to 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The aloe blue elf, sedum spatulifolium or the Pacific stone crop, Thompson's yucca, the Texas sotol, the Semper vivum, uh, this is the hens and chicks. I actually uh, observed this uh, growing in Ohio and surviving the bitter cold winters and snow. If you don't know the cold tolerance of your succulents and you have multiple days of cold weather and or frost in your area, prepare to cover and protect them with frost cloth, sheets, or any light cover except plastic. This will give you an additional four to six degrees Fahrenheit of protection. And you can always start out, if you don't know what's gonna happen, put them in a pot and uh, keep them someplace where it's not gonna get so cold. So this is one of my favorite parts of uh, growing succulents and it's uh, another reason to grow them. You'll end up with more plants than you started with. A friend of mine once said, just recently said, talk about the gift that keeps on giving. So we will show you a couple of the simplest ways to accomplish this. So this, about 10 years ago, I acquired a single cutting of this Aeonium arboreum atropoporium here. It's a beautiful um, rosette growing succulent with nice pretty green, uh, green and red leaves. The initial end cutting, it was, the cutting was only about this size here. The initial end was moist. So I let it dry off for a couple of days till it formed a callus on the end, a callus or a scab. And this is called hardening off. And then I planted it in a very large rectangular container and waited months and months. I, I actually almost gave up on it. But suddenly after about seven or eight months, it just took off. And this has been a great plant to propagate. It's produced hundreds, hundreds of small cuttings. And this is still going strong. 
It grows in a rosette form. It stays fairly compact. This, right, this particular one is in a smallish container and does need to come out of this soon, about every couple of years. Um, the one thing about this, if it doesn't get enough sun, it'll continue to grow, but it'll be mostly green and you'll lose some of the red on it. So this is a sample of a few cuttings that have been taken off um, the mother plant. Um, and it's our, the simplest propagation technique. So these, those cuttings were small, so I put them in pots to get them more established. You can cut the pieces directly from the main plant using clean, sharpened pruners, and then allow the cutting to harden off, as I mentioned previously. So you can put them in pots. You can put, if you have multiple cuttings, you can put them in trays. This is um, a section up at the IUC Botanical Garden has its trays of all their succulents as they're getting more established. And some of the plants will create the offsets or smaller versions of themselves, but you may need to pull the whole plant out and separate the small ones to replant them first. Succulents are very forgiving but you do need to take care taking them apart. So this plant is uh, a Pachyveria bell blue. This is a hybrid of Pachyphytum and an Echeveria. And you can see it's in need of a little help here. Um, it's still blooming. And these, the flower stalks can actually be cut off. They can be put in water. Uh, and kept as just a cut flower, like you would do any one, or put into an arrangement. Um, and then you want to remove the bad looking stuff in the middle that's looking like it's, you don't want to have it anymore. And this I decided to take the whole plant out because you can see there's little baby plantlets at the bottom, but in order to get them off of there, it was just easier taking the whole plant out. Initially, this plant, because it's been in this container now for about three years, it initially did produce some smaller little offsets and then I cut off and uh, put in other uh, arrangements. But I took this whole thing out um, so I can make more plants. So this is when the whole plant was removed. You can see the roots are shallow. Uh, there's lots of leaves that just dropped off. Um, the, the stems I cut off and I actually took the leaflets off the flower stem too, and then let them sit for a couple of days to harden off. This large piece here is gonna go back into the container with some fresh soil. But I'll show you what to do with the leaves. Um, so I'm, I set up a container with some soil and um, Put the leaf cuttings, this is, a, this is the leaves and the tiny plantlets that have been hardened off for a couple of days. And these little ones up here are the ones that came off the flower stalk. So they're placed in soil. The leaves are placed just so that just the very tip is into the soil. And this is where a small little plantlet will eventually grow. Now you always start with more of these than you're going to end up with because they probably they won't all make it, but a lot of them will. And then off that one plant, you're getting a whole bunch more. These are all the tiny little plantlets were at the bottom. And once I had taken the plant out, it was very easy to just cut them. They all had they had a little bit of a stem. Um, and that was once it hardened off, they're in the soil. These will probably root within a few weeks. These will take a lot longer. So this is, uh, these are two of the simplest ways to propagate these plants. And then once, once they do have roots and they're established, um, again, to transplant them either, either into a bigger pot or you know, wherever you want to put them and let them sit for a few days before watering them. Our handout is gonna have some resources in it on how to propagate succulents in more complex ways. You can actually grow them from seeds really take a lot longer. Uh, and there'll be a link to our uh, YouTube program that was done last year on propagation. And then I got to see um, another slightly different way of propagating cuttings. Um, about a few months ago, 
a tray of uh, aloe cuttings were donated to the UC Botanical Garden from the collection of a local friend of the garden who was an aloe aficionado. And this is one of them, this aloe uh, mitroformis. And what they're doing with this is leaving the plant, leaving the sock like it is until a tiny hair light root will form along these little areas here. And then it will go into a pot to, uh, to grow stronger roots. And then when it gets stronger than that, then this will be uh, eventually transplanted into the South Africa section of the Botanic Garden. And then I found out that actually I had left some cuttings of that aeonium in a container that I'd stuck up on a shelf and forgotten about. And the plant was actually, they were still alive and there were tiny little roots forming uh, on it. So something to discover. They all, they, like I said, they're very forgiving. And this um, was another one of the donated aloes, which I found especially beautiful. It's the aloe distans, or also called the jewel aloe. Very golden spines along the border of blue-green leaves. The back of the leaf is almost po polka dotted. And these are also gonna be transplanted into the ground at the um, Botanic Garden. This particular one get, requires full sun to light shade. So I will now turn the program over to Laura, my co-presenter, who is responsible for the organization of this presentation and a very comprehensive handout. She's going to talk about succulent problems and then also where you can go and view succulents in nature. And I thank you all for your time. Uh, as Anna has shared with you many beautiful pictures as well as information on why, how, and where to grow succulents, as well as propagate them. Now, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of common succulent problems, including too much water or too little, too much light or too little, as well as some common insects and fungal pests. After this, I'll share information on some places in our area where you can go enjoy succulents. The appearance of the leaves is really the best way to tell if a succulent is being over or underwatered. An underwatered plant will have wrinkly, shriveled up leaves, as you can see here, and they'll also tend to dry from the bottom of the plant up. Obviously, the more severe the lack of water, the droopier the plant will look. The leaves might even look, in fact, like they're deflated and won't feel firm to the touch. The way to resolve this is to completely wet the root ball, but don't allow water to pull on or below them. Protect it from the sun. If it's in a container, you can move it. And if it's in the ground, you may have to provide some shade. If the plant is too damaged, you may need to make leaf or stem cuttings as Anna just showed us. By contrast, an underwatered succulent will look very different. It'll have soft, mushy, almost translucent leaves. And again, as with everything, it may be possible to save it if you catch it early. It's much harder if the plant is rotting in the root up. So the solution to that is to let the plant dry out, remove as much of the decay as possible to protect the tissue that's still normal. And if the removal of all of this material makes the plant unsightly, Again, you may have to look to leaf cuttings, offsets if you're lucky, or a small stem, or uh, start with a new plant. So in the case of light, if you don't have enough light, you end up with etiolation. And that's a term you may encounter as you learn more about succulents. What it means is that you get more space between the leaves or you may get paler leaves than you originally had in the mother plant. What happens is they start to bend towards the light source as they, and they stretch more in the course of that. While these plants can be perfectly healthy, they may not be as pleasing to the eye as they once were. You can't fix it once it has occurred, but thankfully you can always slice off the bottom of the plant and propagate it from cuttings, leaves, or offsets. Can you detect the theme? Too much light can also be a problem. 
succulents require at least two to three hours of bright light in order to thrive. The temperature range that they typically grow in is from 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If they get exposed to long hours of direct sunlight, they will get sunburned. Hot temperatures combined with high sun exposure will make this more likely. The plants develop these kind of irreversible markings, which can be blackish or brown, or in this case, a reddish color. If you are very attached to the plant, you can make cuttings out of undamaged lower leaves. You see them kind of peeking out over here. Offsets, or again, start over with a new plant. Now I'm gonna to pivot to some of the insect pests and fungal pests that you sometimes see in subjects. It's a very brief introduction. We could literally spend the whole presentation on this. In this and the following slides and in our handout, you will see these links and there too, uh, places in the UC ANR, which is UC Agricultural and Natural Resources website, in their section on integrated pest management or IPN. And there you'll find much more information on how to manage these kinds of pests. Often ants and aphids are found together. The aphids look like these little grains of sand on the leaves of the plants and maybe any color. They can be yellow, orange, black, brown, or this kind of cream color you see here. What happens is that aphids feed primarily on the sap of plants and secrete a liquid that's called honeydew. This secretion is very sugar rich and the ants like it as a food source. The ants in turn protect the aphids from natural predators, making their control more difficult. The good news is that if caught early, aphids can be knocked off with a water spray. Just be sure to dry the succulent well without allowing water to pool in its nooks and crannies. Ants can be discouraged by using sugar and boric acid baits that the ants take back to their nest, which kills them and their fellow ants. Mealybugs can be a persistent and difficult problem to solve. They produce these kind of cottony masses that you see here at the base of these leaves. They're very sticky and they're harder to dislodge with water than aphids. If you catch it early and it's not a big infestation, you can use a Q-tip dipped in alcohol or a spray mixture of alcohol and horticultural soap. The alcohol dries out the mealybugs and they die and the soap coats their bodies and they suffocate. If it is a persistent or growing problem, you may need to take the whole plant out of its pot or wherever it's growing, wash the roots, let it dry, and repot it in fresh soil. Sooty mold is a fungal disease that grows on the surface that's covered by honeydew, produced by the aphids we just mentioned, as well as leaf hoppers and mealybugs and other insects. It produces this sticky black film on the leaves. A fellow master gardener noticed sooty mold on succulents growing below a fruit tree. It turned out that a severe aphid infestation on the tree created abundant honeydew, which was dripping on these succulents. This allowed the sooty mold to thrive. While sooty mold is not harmful to the succulents, it is unattractive. It doesn't infect plants, but can harm them indirectly because by coating the leaves, it impacts the ability of the plant to carry out photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is how plants convert the energy from the sun into sugars that feed it and support its growth. This can lead to stunted growth and poor health in the plant. The solution is to find and manage the insect pests that are creating the honeydew. This could include the water sprays we've already mentioned, ant baits, or keeping ants from getting into trees where they guard the honeydew producing insects. Our master gardener resolved this by covering the plants with frost shield or greenhouse plastic during the height of the dripping. And this also helped to reduce the incidence of the problem. Our next problem is powdery mildew. It's another succulent pest. It produces this kind of whitish film that you see on the succulent. And uh, as a result, the, the plant starts to um, diminish its ability to sustain 
the normal structure of its tissue below that. A powdery mildew can happen in many different plants. Uh, anybody who's tried to grow zucchinis in the West County like I have is very familiar with that. It's common in hydrangeas and in other plants as well. It, it can be species specific. So it differs from other fungal conditions which normally prefer moist environments. Powdery mildew is more common in warm and dry environments. It is encouraged by temperatures typically between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit and shady areas with poor air circulation. The first thing you wanna do is isolate the plant. You don't want it to get on other supplements you have nearby. You can discourage powdery mildew spores by overhead watering, but as you would do with watering to knock off aphids, you basically want to ensure that you do it early in the day so that the plant can dry up thoroughly. You can also prune out any infected areas. Snails and slugs, as you can see from this picture, cause this kind of holes in the plant. They munch the whole half of the top of the center of the plant of the florets. And they also can uh, munch on the edges of the, of the succulent. The main approach is to eliminate their hiding places. They hide in the inside edges of pots, in wood piles and empty containers, essentially anywhere they're basically shaded and oftentimes in moist situations. So what you do is you set up boards or other containers that can trap them. And in the morning, you go out with a bucket of soapy water and basically shove them into that to drown. You can also use beer traps, which they are attracted to and which they also fall into. Or you can use iron phosphate granules that kill them, but blissfully are child and pet safe. So to summarize, these are the general principles that apply to plants in addition to succulents. Check your plants at least every other week. Catching a problem early will make it easier to fix. Isolate the plants as soon as possible. Water sprays can be useful for aphids and powdery mildew, again, paying attention to time. Remove the affected plant, uh, the affected plant parts to reduce the amount of pest or fungus present. Check out the UC ANR IPM recommendations to choose the most earth-friendly and least toxic approach possible which may include use of systemic compounds absorbed through the roots of the plants. Finally, learn when to give up and start over with a cutting leaf or a new plant. The link on this slide and in the handouts will give you many more pest management resources in addition to a link to videos of very short length to three minutes to as much as a half an hour uh, on how you can handle many different pests in your garden. So now we're going to briefly talk about where you can enjoy succulents. We're very lucky to have many places in our area where you can see succulents being grown. You will also encounter knowledgeable volunteers and or staff that can help you learn what grows well in your area and what kinds of conditions these plants like. The websites of the Ruth Bancroft Garden, the UC Botanical Garden in Berkeley, and the San Francisco Botanical Garden share what is available to see at their sites and additional educational resources. Membership to the UC Botanical Garden, the Ruth Bancroft Garden, or the San Francisco Botanical Garden will permit free reciprocal admission to each other, as well as over 300 participating botanical gardens throughout North America. The Regional Park Botanic Garden, the Lakeside Park Garden Center, and the Wave Garden don't charge any admission. You can simply walk into these, but check the links that we will provide in the handout for any pandemic restrictions. The hand to this webinar provided to all who complete our evaluation survey includes books, websites, and many other resources to help you experience the joy of succulents.